It's a pleasure to be with you. The title of this session is Human Papillomavirus Disease and Vaccine. There are no disclosures for this presentation. Objectives include review the epidemiology of HPV, review the major clinical aspects of HPV infections, review HPV vaccines, discuss current ACIP HPV vaccine recommendations, review the safety of HPV vaccine, review the efficacy of HPV vaccines, and discuss effective strategies to improve HPV vaccination rates. Let's first look at some epidemiologic data. A 1999 survey of students indicated that approximately 40% of ninth graders, 13-year-olds, across the United States reported having had sexual intercourse, with that percent rising with each subsequent grade. Males were more sexually active than females at each of the grade levels. There was a higher percent of onset of sexual activity in these age groups among African-American and Hispanic youth versus white adolescents. This slide provides some HPV prevalence data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination NHANES survey 2003 to 2006 for females in the United States aged 14 to 59 years old. In the 14 to 19 year olds, 22% have been infected with low risk HPV serotypes and 25% with high risk serotypes. In 20 to 24 year olds, 35% have been infected with low risk serotypes and 43% with those from the high risk group. In the 25 to 59 year old group, 20 to 30% have been infected with the low and high risk serotypes. This prevalence data emphasizes the importance of focusing on HPV vaccination prior to 14 years of age. These last two slides are major reasons for recommending HPV vaccination in the 11 to 12 year old age group to preempt most but not all sexual activity one could argue, for an even earlier vaccination schedule. This table provides HPV prevalence data from the NHANES survey from 2011 to 2014. Adults 18 to 69 have an any HPV serotype genital infection prevalence of 40 to 45%. One half of the HPV viruses found in this population are of high-risk serotypes. The prevalence of high-risk HPV serotypes in the oral cavity are higher in males, 6.8%, versus females, 1.2%. This graph demonstrates a higher prevalence of HPV in non-Hispanic black adults versus whites and Hispanics. Let's now briefly review key HPV clinical considerations. Most HPV infections are asymptomatic. 70% of HPV infections resolve within one year and 90% within two years. Genital warts are the most common clinical manifestation of HPV in the United States, resulting in about 360,000 cases per year. Juvenile recurrent respiratory papillomatosis is rare, but seen in infected infants post-delivery. HPV infection is associated with intraepithelial lesions of the cervix, vagina, vulva, and anus. A pap smear is used to detect lesions in the cervix. Fortunately, many precancers clear. A major concern is cancer for those individuals who have persistent 
HPV infections. This table provides data on HPV cancers by gender in the United States reported by Sereya et al. in 2015. Generally, HPV is the major cause of cervical, vaginal, vulvar, penile, anal, and oral pharyngeal cancers in the United States. Of the 20,260 new cancers in women, 53% of those cancers were cervical, with 20% anal, 13% vulvar, 3% vaginal, and 11% oral. Of the 13,477 men with HPV cancers, 80% were oral, 6% penile, and 14% anal. Cervical cancer has been decreasing, likely due to enhanced screening and surgical treatment of precancerous lesions. Anal cancers have been increasing in both men and women at a rate of 2.7% per year. The current incidence of anal cancers are females, 1.5 per 100,000, males, 1 per 100,000, and men who have sex with men, 37 per 100,000. Oropharyngeal cancers have also been increasing in both men and women at a rate of 2.7% per year. 70% of oropharyngeal cancers are due to HPV, with an incidence of females, 1.8 per 100,000, and males, 8.2 per 100,000. There are over 170 HPV serotypes. Each serotype is designated by a number. Some HPV serotypes, like HPV5, may establish infections and persist for a lifetime of the individual without ever manifesting clinical symptoms. Types 1 and 2 cause common warts. Types 6 and 11 are associated with genital warts and laryngeal papillomatosis and are considered low risk for cancer. There are 15 carcinogenic serotypes. 70% of HPV cancers are caused by serotypes 16 and 18. Serotypes 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58 cause 15% of female cancers and 5% of male cancers. Red serotypes are those covered by the 9-valent vaccine, Gardasil 9. This graph demonstrates the prevalence of HPV infection stages per age. Infection is often seen soon after the onset of sexual activity and peaks in the late teens and early 20s. Most infections clear or become undetectable within one to two years. Precancers peak between 20 to 45 years of age. Cancer prevalence due to HPV increases after 25 years old and persists throughout adult life. It's estimated that 79 million people are infected with HPV in the United States with an incidence of new infections of 14 million per year. These are pictures of classic warts on the hand, face, and feet. These are pictures of classical genital warts on the penis and perineum. This is a picture of cervical cancer. These are pictures of anal and oral pharyngeal cancers. Let's now consider HPV vaccines. This slide lists the HPV vaccines that have been used in the United States. Bivalent vaccine, Cervarix, was the first and covered types 16 and 18, the cause of 70 to 79 percent of HPV cancers. The quadrivalent vaccine Gardasil 4 also covered types 16 and 18 like Cervarix, and in addition, types 6 and 11 
the cause of 90% of genital warts. The nine-valent vaccine, Gardasil 9, like Gardasil 4, covers types 6, 11, 16, 18, and additionally, types 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58, covering 90% of HPV serotypes that cause cancer. HPV vaccine is a major cancer prevention tool. The bivalent vaccine, Cervarix, was licensed for females 9 to 25 years old, given at 0, 1 to 2 months, and 6 months. The quadrivalent vaccine, Gardasil 4, was licensed for males and females 9 to 26 years old, also given at 0, 1 to 2 months, and 6 months. Both Cervarix and Gardasil 4 vaccines have been discontinued. The only HPV vaccine currently available in the United States is the nine-valent vaccine, Gardasil 9. Gardasil 9, once again, covers all the HPV types covered by the bivalent vaccine, Cervarix, and quadrivalent vaccine, Gardasil 4, along with five additional types, 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. These additional serotypes covered in Gardasil 9 are the cause of 15% of female cancers and 5% of male cancers. Gardasil 9 is licensed for females and males 9 to 45 years old. Gardasil 9 has a two-dose schedule for those 9 to 14 years old at 0 and 6 to 12 months. The two-dose schedule for those 9 to 14 years old should enhance uptake. For those 15 to 45 years old, a three-dose schedule is recommended at 0, 1 to 2 months, and 6 months. This is a more detailed table associating HPV types with clinical lesions. The red print highlights those types covered by Gardasil 9. Please note that Gardasil 9 does not cover all types associated with cancer, warts, or other lesions, but it has better coverage than the older bivalent and quadrivalent vaccines. Once again, Gardasil 9 can prevent 90% of HPV cancers. Let's spend the next few minutes discussing the current ACIP HPV vaccine recommendations. The ACIP recommends routine vaccination of all children at 11 to 12 years old, since this will reach most, but not all children, before onset of sexual activity. Gardasil 9 can be given as early as nine years old as licensed. Use at nine years of age would particularly apply to children with a history of sexual abuse. So why did the ACIP choose 11 to 12 year olds for HPV vaccine? Why not nine years old for all children? The 11 to 12 year old age group is also the time for other recommended vaccines, including the first dose of meningococcal vaccine, Tdap, along with the yearly influenza vaccination. This is also a key time for catch-up vaccinations when the child is in for their recommended 11 to 12 year old well child clinical assessment. This slide lists some additional HPV vaccine recommendations. Give two doses for those children nine to 14 years old at zero and six to 12 months. The minimal separation of doses is five months. If the first dose is initiated after the 15th birthday, give three doses at zero, one to two months, and six months. If the first dose of vaccine is given before 15 years old, they only need to receive one additional dose given five to six months after the first dose. The reason for the two dose schedule for those under 15 and three dose schedule for those over 15 is due to a two to four fold higher antibody response in the 11 to 14 year olds 
versus the 15 to 26 year old age group. Protection from Gardasil 9 lasts at least 10 years and possibly as long as 20 years. The need for booster doses is currently unknown. Anyone with primary or secondary immunocompromising conditions from 9 to 26 years old should be given the three dose series at 0, 1 to 2 months, and 6 months. Remember that the minimum interval between the two doses of Gardasil 9 is 5 months. Gardasil 9 vaccine can be used to complete a series started with the older bivalent or quadrivalent vaccine. Therefore, consider a child with a normal immune system fully vaccinated with two vaccine doses given when the first dose, Cervarex or Gardasil 4, was given before the 15th birthday and the second dose, Gardasil 9, was given greater than six months after the first dose. The exception to that would be if Gardasil 9 was used for both those doses since the minimum interval between Gardasil 9 doses is five months. There are no ACIP recommendations for revaccination with Gardasil 9 of those having completed an adequate bivalent or quadrivalent vaccine. Consider them complete. The ACIP feels it's more important to use current resources to get the unvaccinated vaccinated with any series versus focusing on revaccination. Yet having said that, there is no contraindication for administering a series of Gardasil 9 after having previously completed a series of bivalent or quadrivalent vaccine. There is no maximum interval between doses. Therefore, the vaccine schedule does not need to be restarted if there is a longer than recommended number of months between doses. This slide lists the immunocompromising conditions that would require a three-dose series for those 9 to 26 years old, including B lymphocyte antibody deficiency, T lymphocyte complete or partial defects, HIV infection, malignant neoplasm, transplantation, autoimmune disease, and immunosuppressive therapy. In June 2019, the ACIP voted to recommend catch-up vaccination for all persons through age 26 years old who are not adequately vaccinated. This harmonized the recommendations for males and females to age 26 replacing the old recommendation of catch-up vaccination for females to age 26 and males to age 21. In 2019, the ACIP also recommended that adults, males and females 27 to 45 years old could also receive HPV vaccine if the patient and their clinician decide this would be beneficial for them. The FDA has licensed HPV vaccine through age 45. This process of discussion and decision for HPV vaccination made between the patient and their clinician is called shared clinical decision making. This means that HPV vaccination is not recommended for all adults between 27 and 45 as part of the adult immunization schedule, but can be administered if it's felt beneficial for the patient. This permissive recommendation generally results in insurance companies covering this vaccine. There are three recommendations ACIP can make for vaccinations they've studied. One, the vaccine is not recommended. Two, shared clinical decision making, like that ACIP made for HPV vaccine in adults 27 to 45 years old. This is a permissive vaccine recommendation. Three, the vaccine is recommended for all persons in an age group like HPV for everyone between the ages of 11 and 26 years old. Shared clinical decision-making is used when vaccines may be beneficial for some individuals, 
but will have relatively minimal population level impact. Also, for clinicians, shared clinical decision making means they may consider discussing HPV vaccinations with patients who are most likely to benefit from an immunization, but they don't have to discuss these vaccinations with every person over 26 years old. Shared clinical decision making for HPV vaccine also means that CDC is not actively promoting HPV vaccine for adults over 26 years old. For pregnant women, HPV vaccination should be delayed until after pregnancy. However, pregnancy testing is not needed before vaccination. What metrics or outcomes can we use to determine HPV vaccine efficacy? There are essentially three stages of HPV outcomes, early, middle, and late. The early stage would provide outcomes within a few years. This essentially looks at impact on genital warts. These early outcomes may also provide the prevalence of HPV vaccine types in populations at risk, but not necessarily data on risks for cancer. Mid-stage outcomes would be seen in years to decades and would gather pre-cancer or intra-epithelial change data. Late-stage outcomes would be seen in decades, 10 to 20 years or more, and would relate to HPV-associated cancers due to persistent HPV infections with carcinogenic HPV serotypes. We need to evaluate for all three outcomes, early, mid, and late, to determine vaccine efficacy. Currently, monitoring is in the early and mid stage, focusing on data related to genital warts and pre-cancer or intra-epithelial changes. Obviously, the ultimate interest of public health is to decrease HPV-associated cancers, the late outcomes, yet that will take 10 to 20 years or more. Politicians are particularly interested in short-term impact. Therefore, it will be imperative for public health to measure those early and mid-stage metrics and appropriately develop messages that extrapolate those results to more long-term impacts on HPV-associated cancers. This slide looks at some monitoring results, some early and mid outcomes for HPV vaccine impact. The prevalence of HPV vaccine types are decreasing in Australia, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Genital warts are decreasing in Australia, New Zealand, Denmark, Sweden, Germany, Quebec, and the United States. In fact, there were almost no genital warts due to HPV serotypes 6 and 11 identified in Australia in 2017. Cervical lesions, intraepithelial neoplasia, have been decreasing in Australia, British Columbia, Denmark, Sweden, and the United States. This graph published in 2019 demonstrates marked declines in HPV prevalence from 71% to 86% in those from 14 to 24 years old due to HPV vaccinations. Declines in prevalence are obviously less in the 25 to 34 year olds. Some declines in the 25 to 34 year olds are due to vaccinated individuals entering that age group. This table provides data on the prevalence of HPV vaccine types identified in the NHANES National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey reported in pediatrics in 2016. This data compares the prevalence before Gardasil 4 from 2003 to 2006 compared with 2009 to 2012 after Gardasil 4 was approved. There was a 34 to 64% decrease 
in the four HPV vaccine types, 6, 11, 16, and 18 over six years versus no change in prevalence in the 25 to 29 year old unvaccinated group. Types 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58, the additional types covered in Gardasil 9 were not covered with Gardasil 4. As expected, there was essentially no change over those six years for those five serotypes. Vaccine efficacy to decrease vaccine serotype prevalence in the 14 to 24 year old group was calculated to be 89%. So there have been some good early and mid outcome results supporting HPV vaccine efficacy. Common HPV vaccine adverse reactions include headache, fever, nausea, dizziness, injection site swelling, bruising, erythema, pruritus, and swelling. This slide looks at HPV vaccine safety. 79 million doses of quadrivalent vaccine Gardasil 4 and 12 million of Gardasil 9 doses have been distributed in the United States by 2017. Post licensure monitoring is accomplished through three reporting systems, including the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, VAERS, Vaccine Safety Data Link, VSD studies, and the pregnancy registries for Cervarex and Gardasil 4. The latter system is currently closed since Cervarex and Gardasil 4 are no longer available. New adverse events associated with Gardasil 9 include syncope due to a vasovagal response in the first five to 10 minutes common with vaccinations in general. Therefore, it's important to encourage patients to sit or lie down for a few minutes after vaccine injections. Possible anaphylaxis in one per million doses. There has been no significant association with Guillain-Barre, multiple sclerosis, autoimmune disease, primary ovarian failure, stroke, venous thromboembolism, appendicitis, seizures, allergic reactions, or celiac disease, though these and other potential signals are continually being monitored by the post licensure surveillance systems. The concern about autoimmune disease related to the adjuvant used in the vaccine that stimulates immune response to the virus. So Gardasil 9 with current post licensure data is a safe vaccine. In 2017, roughly half 49% of adolescents were up to date on the HPV vaccine and 66% of adolescents ages 13 to 17 years received the first dose to start the vaccine series. On average, the percentage of adolescents who started the HPV vaccine series increased by five percentage points each year from 2013 to 2017. We need to improve our coverage of adolescents in the United States to reach the Healthy People 2020 goal of 80% of adolescents being appropriately vaccinated with HPV vaccine. Effective strategies to improve HPV vaccination rates include emphasize the importance of HPV vaccine to prevent cancer, Utilize the four effective HPV vaccine communication components. Implement multiple points of intervention. Ensure consistent positive messages throughout the patient visit. And be patient. It's important to emphasize HPV cancer prevention to most parents during the child's 11 to 12 year old visit. This graph represents an HPV vaccination study of participants who had low, medium, or high confidence in vaccinations. 
For those in the low confidence group, 5.3% intended to vaccinate after a control message, 5.4% after a CDC message, and 12.3% after a message that emphasized cervical cancer prevention was delivered. For those in the medium vaccine confidence group, 13% intended to receive HPV vaccine in the control group, 15.5% after the CDC message, and 17% after a cervical cancer message was delivered. In the high confidence group, the CDC message seemed more effective in increasing intention to receive the HPV vaccine versus the cervical cancer message. The reason for this was not apparent. A main point is that for parents with low or medium confidence in vaccinations, a message that emphasizes cervical cancer prevention will increase intent to vaccinate. This slide lists four effective HPV vaccine communications concepts reported by Brewer et al. in pediatrics in 2017. Mention the child's age during the 11 to 12 year old office visit. Announce the child is due for three vaccines during that visit, meningococcal quadrivalent vaccine, HPV and Tdap. This would be expanded to include the influenza vaccine if the annual vaccine is available. Place the HPV vaccine in the middle of the list versus at the end. This seems to normalize the HPV vaccine. State you will vaccinate today, a presumptive, not participatory recommendation. This graph demonstrates the efficacy of using the four effective HPV vaccine communications components on HPV coverage in clinical practice settings. The four components approach resulted in more HPV vaccine coverage at three and six months versus conversation about vaccines only. Using the four communication components in a practice setting increases HPV vaccine coverage. This is an example of how those four communications components are used in communicating with parents. Now that Lisa is 11, she is due for three vaccines, the meningococcal vaccine, HPV vaccine, and Tdap. These will help protect her from the infections that cause meningitis, HPV cancers, and pertussis or whooping cough. We'll give those shots today. This last sentence, we'll give those shots today, is a presumptive recommendation, different from a participatory recommendation on the right. What do you think about vaccinating Lisa today? This table is adapted from an article published in 2013 by Opal et al. in Pediatrics, comparing presumptive versus participatory vaccine recommendations. A presumptive recommendation results in 74% accepting and 26% resisting. A participatory recommendation results in 4% accepting, 83% resisting, and 13% providing their own vaccination plan. Presumptive recommendations improve parent vaccine acceptance. The Community Guide for Increasing Vaccinations referenced on this slide states that multiple point interventions are better than focusing on one intervention. As diagrammed, there are many interconnected factors that influence preventive behaviors and the ultimate outcome of decreasing vaccine preventable diseases like HPV. Supportive and coordinated vaccine policies, factors, practices, and interventions will result in better vaccine outcomes. 
Consistent messages practice-wide are essential to prevent confusion and emphasize the importance of HPV vaccination. All practice staff must be committed to an HPV-associated cancer prevention mission and vision. Practice leadership must cast, reinforce, and maintain that cancer prevention mission and vision. Reinforce HPV vaccination as a practice norm. All staff should use clear and consistent HPV messages. Use talking to parents handouts like this one pictured from the CDC website. Educate staff about HPV vaccine recommendations, including schedules, administration, storage, and handling. Practice patience and don't give up if parents initially resist or reject vaccines. This report by Cornetus published in 2018 demonstrated that 45% of parents who initially declined HPV vaccination accepted it at a later visit, and an additional 24% intended to accept HPV vaccine in the next year. Reasons for later acceptance included child getting older, 45%, learned more about HPV vaccine, 34%, underlining the importance of providing parental educational materials and received a provider recommendation, 33%. A main point is that parents who received a high quality, presumptive recommendation and appropriate HPV education during the first visit were more likely to accept the vaccine at a later visit. So practice patience and persist in recommending the HPV vaccine. In summary, HPV infections rise rapidly after the onset of sexual activity. HPV vaccine should be given to children 11 to 12 years old. HPV vaccine is an effective cancer prevention strategy. Nine-valent HPV vaccine can prevent 90% of HPV-associated cancers. HPV vaccine can be given to adults 26 to 45 years old through a shared decision-making process. Presumptive recommendations, patience, and persistence improves HPV vaccination rates. Take your public health practice skills to the next level. Our specialized certificate courses give you an opportunity to work systematically through a public health topic and demonstrate your understanding of that material in a capstone project. Learn more and sign up at ndphtn.com certificates.